that you know that you are grateful. And I was like, I know Miss Nola is one of the people that she is always thankful for something. If you go behind her house, she's going to take you to the back. She'll go to her house, she'll take you to the back of the house, and she'll show you every flower, and she will tell you. Like, there's actually a story. And it's just such a such sense of gratitude that almost, like, invades other people's spaces. And she is, I think it's one of the things I like about her. I'm sorry, Miss Nola, that I'm picking on you, but you just exude that sense of gratitude all of the time. And... Uh, but we certainly know people in our lives that have such a sense of gratitude, who are always thankful, no matter what, no matter the circumstance. And most often when we talk at Thanksgiving, we are thinking about the things God has done, like we shared this morning when we're praying. We think about all the things God has done that we have to be grateful for. But this morning, I want to, us to look at it from another lens. Yes, we want to thank God for all what he has done and all what he's doing. But what if we thank God in spite of? What if we are able to thank God even when he hasn't done it yet? Or even when we are not sure he's going to do it? What if we are able to thank God in spite of the storms, in spite of the challenges, in spite of the battles? It's easy to tell God thank you when I have a newborn baby. It's easy to tell God thank you when a grandchild is coming. But will I still tell God thank you? When things don't work out the way I planned or the way I wanted. And that's, that's my goal as we look at, at the scriptures, several scriptures this morning. So thank you, Donna, for, for reading. I, I confused her. I changed. Uh, I realized I had a typo. Instead of John, um, Luke 17, I had Luke 19. It's the same. The, the verses were the same, but then it was. So I edited that, but she did not get the edit that I sent to the, <laughs> to the team. So I'm sorry for that, and thank you for being gracious. Uh, so... In the, the book of Luke that we read, Jesus is on his way, and then these ten lepers meet him. There are a few things that are strange in this text. The first thing is that we have ten lepers, nine of them are Jews, and one of them is a Samaritan. And if we know a little about that culture, we know that Jews and Samaritans don't hang out together. They were like sworn enemies. And for a Jew and um, for Jews and Samar it's Samaritan to be together in the same place, there is something that certainly brings them together. And I think it's because all of them is their brokenness. All of them are outcasts. And because we are all outcasts from our society, now we can come together and form another group. So their leprosy brings them together. And in this space of brokenness, they are able to mingle and be together. And so Jesus is walking past, and these 10 lepers meet, they don't really meet him from afar, they see him, and they shout, Jesus, please heal us, have mercy. And Jesus doesn't come close to them to touch them or anything, he just tells them, hey guys, go to the priest, and show yourself, it's almost like saying, you are healed, go. And the guys believe Jesus, and they start walking on their way to go see the priest, because they know that the only reason why you go to the priest was to present yourself for the priest to inspect and affirm your healing. They knew that they had received the healing. They knew what Jesus was capable of. So on their way, they started seeing, oh, wow, we are made whole. Oh, my, there's no more leprosy. Oh, my, my skin is clean. What is funny is that all the nine Jews kept on their way and just went to see the priest. And then this one Samaritan says, I'm excited, but I know I'm going to go see the priest, but let me come back to Jesus. And there are several, there are several reasons why this must have been. Uh, I'm going to first imagine why maybe the Jews didn't come back. They were going to their priest, so why would they come back to Jesus was not their priest, he was just a miracle worker. Maybe they were like, well, he's done the miracle, he's done his part, let me go see my priest to confirm that I finally have got what I wanted. But another assumption might be that, do they just have a sense of entitlement? Jesus, you did your job. You have been the miracle worker, so I got, well, or we are all Jews, and you did a miracle for a Jew, so there's, why should I thank you for something that we are all, was it just a sense of entitlement that they felt that Jesus had to do it? And these are just questions that the text doesn't really tell us so much, but so I'm just assuming, oh, when these Jews just saying, let's go first, just in case something happens, Jesus changes his mind, let's go first and show 
the priest as ourselves and let him see that we are really clean so we can get back into culture and get back into life like normal. And this Samaritan, he returns to Jesus. And I'm wondering if he returns to Jesus because he didn't have a priest to go to. And Jesus is like, oh, you sent us to the priest and I've been going to this priest that I know I probably will not be accepted. Now that I've been healed, let me come back to the person that I really consider my priest. Is that why he came? Or was it just a sense of gratitude that brought him back to Jesus? But when you look at the text, we assume we can tell that it's actually a sense of gratitude. Because Jesus asked him, is it only you who came back to say thank you? So we know that the reason why this guy came back wasn't just because Jesus was a priest. wasn't just because he wasn't a Samaritan. It was because he had a sense of deep gratitude in the inside of him that made him like, no, I've got to go back and see this guy who has done this and tell him, thank you. So he comes back to Jesus and tells him, thank you. And Jesus said something that for me launches a path for what we are going to do this morning. Jesus says, not only are you healed, but you have been made whole. His gratitude, not just brought, he was healed already, but Jesus is like, because you came and said, thank you, I'm turning all of this all around. You are made whole completely. No more leprosy. You are clean. You are fine. You are whole. You are perfect. And I wonder at times, if at times God wants us to give him thanks in the middle of the process. And as I think of this text, it reminds me of the situation in the book of John, where Jesus had to feed 5,000 people, and he had only two fish and five loaves of bread. Jesus would have complained, man, it's only two fish and five loaves of bread, what do we do with this? How many times do we face things in life and we, it's easy to see the challenge and instead of seeing the possibility? It's easy, it's easy to see what cannot happen, the reality of the land, the reality of what is less, instead of being able to pause and say, God, thank you. And so as Jesus enters into this place, the Bible says he takes the, the loaf and the bread and he gave thanks. And when he gives thanks, he multiplies, he tells the disciples, take, share it, and they were able to feed 5,000. Uh, some theologians believe that the 5,000 were just men, the women and the children are not being counted, so maybe about 12,000 pos possible in that space that were fed. And what is amazing is that when John is trying to retell the story in verse 23 of the same chapter, John says, let me, he says, however, there came, there came other boats from Tiberias near the place where they did eat bread after Jesus had given thanks. So John is renaming this place where they are. He says this is the place where people ate bread after Jesus had given thanks. It doesn't make sense. I would say it's a place where Jesus multiplied bread. No. He says they ate bread after Jesus had given thanks. So the, Paul, John is associating Jesus' gratitude to the multiplication of the bread. So the only reason why they could eat was because there was a, sp a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving that would initiate the process. So John is like, they gave thanks. He g they, they ate bread after Jesus had given thanks. There was a breakthrough after, after Jesus had given thanks. And what if we can say, the miracle came after we had given thanks. It was after they had given thanks that they saw the miracle. And it's not only John who does that. Paul is one of those people. Paul, if you, the story of Paul's life is just amazing. He's been in jail. He's been locked up. He's suffered for the sake of the gospel. He's been persecuted. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. Kept to, getting to the place where he's near death. But in the midst of this, the sense of gratitude that Paul has, when he's locked up in jail with Silas, he is praising and singing. In our time, we'll be like, God abandoned me. You know, when I was going through that, I, I felt like God was alone. He abandoned me. I don't even think God is real. Mm. Anybody's heard people talk like that? Oh, God wasn't there. What if God was there, but we just didn't see him because our attitude was wrong? And so Paul, Paul says something in Philippians chapter 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything.
only thing, but in every situation, the good and the bad, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be anxious about nothing in everything. Paul did not say in some things. He didn't say when everything is going well, where all your prayers are answered, when your business is thriving, he says in everything, in every circumstance, with prayer and thanksgiving. And at times as God's people, it's easy to say, God, thank you, when we have the answers. But my challenge to us this morning is that can we thank him when we don't have the answers? Can we still praise when we don't have the response that we are looking for? Another person in scripture that had such a heart of gratitude was David. David finds himself and he writes all of the Psalms and a lot of it was in the time of battle when Saul is coming against his life. Times when he went to sleep and didn't know if he was going to be alive the next day except for the promises that God had given to him. David is in this place of just Constant tension, constant battle, constant running and hiding. But the kind of Psalms that David is writing is incredible. And one that I really like well is Psalms 23. And reading Psalms 23, I remember growing up when I used to read this in my mind. I don't know if it's just my African mind or any of you ever thought that way. Was that when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm thinking of this green field of grass, abundance of grass. No, David is not writing from that place. It's in the place of dryness in the valley. He's, it's in this space where he's like, there is actually, it doesn't even, when, when we come and look at it from our perspective in that culture, we're going to be like, where is the grass you're talking about? Because we won't be able to find it. That is where David is writing this kind of psalm from. And in verse 20, verse 5, he says, you prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemy. Not in spite of my enemy. You prepare a table for me. In the presence of the health challenge. You prepare a table for me. In the presence of the chaos in my family. You prepare a table for me. In the presence of the crisis that child is going through. You prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemy. Can you sit on the table with God and the enemy is on your face and still say, God, thank you? That's the test of true faith. True faith is not tested when everything is going well. It's when the storms of life hit. Can we pause and still say, God, thank you? Another person that we see in scripture is Job. I like Job. Not because of his suffering, but because of his attitude. Job is one of those stories that most of us, we don't want to read it because we are like, oh my, this is just so miserable. This is so um, depressing and all of that. But in the midst of Job's suffering, this is one of the things that he says, tells God. He says, God, even though you slay me, yet I will trust you. Even if I'm dying, God, my faith in you will not be shaken because I know at the end of it, you will be glorified in my life. I'm not loving you, God, because of what you do to me. I'm loving you just because you are God and you are good. And it might not look in my life like the goodness is there, but I have seen it already and I don't have to worry. My wife might be rejecting me and asking me to curse you, but God, even though you slay me, I will still trust you. My faith will be unshaken. And we are Methodists and we read hymns, we, we sing a lot of hymns, we've just sang some of them this morning. Whether it is, it is well, several of the hymns, when you look at the stories behind the hymns, they were not sung from a place of victory and abundance. Most of them were sung from a place of deep groaning and suffering. And one of the hymns that we sing is during other Thanksgiving services, is now thank we all our God. It was written by Pastor uh, Rinkert, uh, David Rinkert. He was a German minister of the gospel. He was a, 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 a theology and a seminary professor. He was also a musician. He wrote songs and just really good with music. 
and he, was, he probably wrote it either during the war or after the war, 30 years in their nation where there was just so much, everything was deplorable, and he had all, the, all of these refugees that he had to take care of them. And food was limited. There was very little to, to eat or even spare. And then not only that, the plague added to it. And as a pastor, he was doing at times 50 funerals. In that, so it, it was in this space of just so much grief, in this place of so much pain, that he writes the song. And let, let's see the next, the next slide, because I want us to look at the lyrics, lyrics of that song. Because at times when we sing it, oh, is that, let's go back. Did I miss that? Okay, I think I missed it. But it says, now thank we all our God with hands and hearts and voices. Who wondrous things has done. Like, when you look, you're, you're like, I, I'm thinking it's people who are sitting in church and praising God and then start just start writing because of God is good. No. He's writing this song with his, thinking of his family on the table who are eating crumbs, leftovers, probably from refugees. That is the place from which he's writing this song. Now thank we all our God with our hearts, with our hands, with our voices for the wondrous things he has done. Who is going to say God has done wondrous things when you're in war, you're doing funerals, and people are dying, and sickness, almost everything is happening to you. Your family doesn't have food, and you're still saying, thank we all our God. But today we sing those hymns, and we are blessed by them. Because someone was able to give gratitude in the middle of the storm. And what is amazing is that any time we start giving gratitude in the middle of the storm is that things change. At times it's not that things change physically, but then the posture of our hearts change. It changes from the place of depression to a place of hope and restoration. Our perspective changes. We start seeing the same situation we are in completely differently. And people from the outside may look at us and worry and like, hey, but we know that there is a God with us. And so they wonder, why can we still sing? Why are we still praising? Why are we still strong and going? Because for us, we know that there is a God with us in the middle of the storms. And that allows us to keep enduring each step of the way. So a few things happens when we are able to really thank God in the middle of the storm. Is that multiplication and miracles happen. Like Jesus with the bread. Five lo loaves and two fishes. And he said, thank you. And God was able to multiply that. When we can say, God, thank you for the resources and for those who made pledge cards. Maybe we don't know what the, 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 what, what the, what the pledges have reached up to. But whatever it is, we are saying, God, thank you. For a church of people who are generous enough to give up their resources. And we know God takes over the, the job of multiplying the rest. And making sure that everything that is needed is provided. Thank you. When we say thank you, God knows how to change that challenge into an opportunity for God to be glorified. When Paul and Silas were locked up in prison... And I would sit there and probably be complaining. God, you know, I've been serving you all this time. And look at me now, I'm in prison and you didn't even do anything. And those people are accusing me falsely. And... But they are singing and they are praying and they are praising God. And God is like, yes, finally somebody I can use to show myself. And the Bible says the prison does open when they are sleeping. And the chains fell off. But it doesn't only fall off for Paul and Silas, but every other person in jail is set free because someone in the middle of their storm can sing praise to God. And we never really know what our storms, our ability to praise in the middle of the storm can do in the lives of those who are watching us. Because there is someone who is going through another storm and then you don't even know that they are watching you. But the ability to sing and to praise in the middle of that becomes God's instrument to bring transformation to them. And God is glorified in the middle of it. Can we go back just one more, please? Back to that verse. Chains fall off. Prison doors open. Walls fall. Impossibilities become possible when we are able to praise in the middle of a storm. My prayer for us as a people, as a church, 
is that we are a people who praise God when all is well. But we are, able, we are also a people who are able to praise God even when all is not well. That we are people who are able to praise God when all the prayers are answered. But that we are also a people who are able to praise God even the prayers are not yet answered. That we are a people who are able to praise God for what he does. But then we are able to also praise God in spite of what he does. So even if he doesn't do it, we will still praise you. That we can say like Job, even though you slay me yet, I will trust you. As you enter into Thanksgiving, would you take a moment to pause and look back at some of those challenges and some of those storms in your life, some of those things that you're like, God, would you take this away? And instead of saying, God, take it away, would you start saying, God, thank you that you have been with me in it every step of the way, that you have given me strength. I don't even know how I would have endured it so far, but thank you. Can we be a people who can say, God, thank you, in spite of? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you that you are good and your mercy is sent here forever. We thank you, God, that even when we don't seem to know the way or understand the path or see fully what you are doing, you are still good. Open our eyes, God, to see you at work in every circumstance. Fill us and baptize us with such a heart of gratitude, God, that even when things don't work out or line up the way we want, that your praise will never leave, leave our lips. May our hearts and our mouths be filled with thanksgiving and gratitude as we remember each day your promise to us that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.